Alltså Jean-Louis är med också. Mm. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome again to um, uh, the uh, Journal of Internal Medicine Symposium Scientific Evidence of Limited Workup when too much is too much and too little too little. And um, yesterday we have had several different aspects about this on uh, basically finding the right care, the appropriate care for the right patient to optimize care for the individual patient. And um, we have uh, this uh, morning uh, two excellent talks. And um, uh, I would like to start to introduce uh, the first speaker, Professor Jean-Louis Vincent from uh, uh, Brussels, Belgium. Uh, Jean-Louis, he is a uh, uh, professor of intensive care medicine at the Université Libre in Brussels and also a clinical intensive care physician at the Department of Intensive Care at the Erasmus University Hospital uh, also in Brussels. And, and uh, he has been um, president of the World Federation of Society of Intensive Care and critical care medicine, uh, the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, European Shock Society, amongst others. Um, he's a member of the, the Belgian Royal Academy of Medicine and has been honored the uh, Baron title by the King of Belgium. And he has an impressive production of scientific uh, articles, more than 1,000 uh, peer-reviewed articles, and, and H index of 183. And Jean-Louis will, will take us to the intensive care uh, setting of the elderly in an internal medicine perspective. And the title of your talk is Appropriate Care for the Elderly in Intensive Internal Medicine Care. Uh, uh, please, the word is your, yours, Professor Vincent. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to contribute uh, to this um, meeting. And thank you for uh, this kind introduction. Uh, I have um, some slides to show, and um, I will actually go ahead and uh, As you say, we need to know our limitations, not only when not to start a treatment, but also when to stop it. And of course, these are important questions in the ICU. I guess we all agree that we would like to end our life without pain, peacefully, surrounded by relatives and friends, in our favorite place, we should be able to know when it's approaching and we would like to avoid life support. Life support should be applied when there is a chance of recovery, not just of life, but quality of life. And this is one example among thousands of a patient who was clearly dead. He had uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, didn't work. We put him on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. He was in severe cardiogenic shock. And here he is, quite a while later, and he still has a tube for feeding, but that will be removed soon. But when we see reports like this one from Canada, Speaking about very elderly patients, older than 80 years of age, in 24 Canadian ICUs. Actually, a number of these patients stayed in the ICU for quite a long time. One half of them died, and the authors conclude by saying that this raises questions about the use of critical care at the end of life 
for the very elderly. We must be aware of that. Of course, elderly people can come to the ICU, but they will die as we will all. And you know, William Osler used to say that pneumonia is the old man's friend because it's a cause of death in elderly people. And we have to realize that the, with the progress in medicine, we often have to decide when someone may die. It's not a surprise. This is a paper from Belgium in the New England Journal of Medicine showing that death is preceded by at least one end of life practice in about one half of the cases. Oh, in Belgium, you have euthanasia. No, 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 euthanasia is very rare. Of course, we have a law allowing euthanasia in special circumstances, but you can see this concerns about you know, one, two percent of deaths. So it's more a decision to stop or actually not to start a treatment or increase opiates, sedatives. The doctor is not always against death. We should focus on quality of life. As I tell my students, we should never forget that the goal of medicine is health. We are healthcare practitioners. And as we know, health is a physical and mental and social well-being. So we are there to provide well-being. It's usually preservation of life, but not always. Sometimes we have to give up. So the situation has changed in intensive care medicine from the period where we wondered what we can do to go to what we should do. Today, intensivists have become healthcare planners. They need to deal with older patients with comorbidities, multiple hits, and readmissions. You know, when you look at these stairs, it's in French, but it's easily understandable. We are up there, just below the guy with the keys at the belt. Intensive care stay is just one period in a long process. There is a before the ICU, and there is an after the ICU, with sometimes long convalescence and sometimes persisting organ failure. The ICU should not be a place where people come to die. Are we always reasonable? What we call withholding, of course, refers to what we shouldn't do. It could be organ transplantation already relatively early in our lives. It could be no dialysis, no mechanical ventilation. That's the evolution of uh, aging and disease. So I like the word proportionality of care, because it's not a yes or no, it's proportional. If you are eight years old, should you undergo a chemotherapy for a cancer, yes or no? Maybe yes, maybe no, it's proportionality of care. But at the end, we should give up and recognize that death may be the best person's interest. So sometimes we just say, oh, we will just do a minimum. Patient has some dementia, but you know, that's what the resident told me one day. We just hydrated the patient. But how come that the patient had hypernatremia? That's a patient couldn't drink any longer. Or another patient was found in a, in a, in a pond, in a pond, I'm sorry, and uh, I just rewarded the patient and nothing else. Or the patient came in the emergency room with acute abdomen. Oh, 
the surgeon came in and said, oh, acute abdomen, I need to operate. Please rehydrate the patient. And then the patient had cardiac arrest. And then we resuscitated the patient and we started the therapeutic hypothermia to protect the brain. But wait a minute. We learned that this patient was actually very elderly, living in a nursing home with dementia and poor quality of life. What have we done? Does my mother really need that central line that we recommend with the surviving sepsis campaign? I love this editorial because it makes us think. Proportionality of care or adapted therapy, if you like, that's really what we need. Otherwise, the Anglo-Saxons would say it's futile therapy. In French, we don't like that word because futile means vain, worthless, but it's more than that. In French, we say acharnement thérapeutique, acharnement. You can hear carne, the meat, it's the animal that doesn't want to leave his prey. So it's st stubbornness. That, that's part of the concept of acharnement thérapeutique. But Hippocrates was already referring to that when medicine was just trivial. Physicians should refuse to treat those who are overmastered by their disease, realizing that in such cases, medicine is powerless. This is in French, it's just to say that in Belgium, our uh, bioethics committee referred, as you can see at the bottom here, to the disproportion of means and costs with regard to the results. Proportionality, that's exactly what we need. So ICU admission is already, of course, a big question. We should admit in the ICU, people who have some physiologic reserve, of course, there should be a severe illness, but also we should have effective interventions. Even in younger individuals with terminal cancer, sometimes there is no possible intervention. We should not bring that patient in the ICU. Likewise, if it's dementia, advanced Alzheimer's disease. I like this uh, statement here. Frail elderly patients have poor outcomes after a stay in the ICU and are rarely consulted. So we will discuss the advanced directives during this presentation. And patients and their families should be involved and we should have information about this. Now, just opening a parenthesis, you know, leaving the patient on the floor with some form of ICU care may not be better. We need to ask two questions. Can an ICU stay contribute to improve the patient's well-being? And has the patient reasonable chances to recover a meaningful life? I know meaningful life is relatively unprecise, I agree, but that's really what we mean. What would be the quality of life? Should we admit a patient with permanent vegetative state in the ICU? Yes or no? I think no. Many patients have a history before they arrive in the ICU. And this is just one illustration of severe disability before the patient comes in the ICU. And of course, if there is a severe disability, there will remain a severe disability, which is chronic after the ICU stay. So we need to consider that and take this into account as it is important when we speak about the prognosis what will be the quality of life after the ICU stay. I like this paper, which is an inquiry. They ask people, would you rather be dead or have this or that impairment? And you can see when you go uh, to, the, you start from the right in a wheelchair, many people would say, yeah, that's okay. At home all day, yeah. It's okay. But then when you go to the left, when you look at bowel and bladder incontinence, most people would say, I would prefer to be dead. 
Of course, it's an individual choice. We cannot say it's 100%, but we need to take that into account. Sometimes there are conflicts around the ICU admission. Our colleagues from the floor would say, I want my patient to go to the ICU. And we would say, no, 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 the patient should not go to the ICU. And these are very difficult conflicts because there is only one department of intensive care in the hospital. So we are there offering a service to the entire hospital. How can you manage that? And also, there may be a problem of uh, lack of ICU beds. Distributive justice is the fourth important bioethical principle. Allocation of equal goods to all members of the society. And one aspect could be the limited number of beds. Then we need to leave patients who are not too sick outside the ICU or patients who are too sick outside the ICU. That's what we apply in disaster medicine. And if the ICU is almost full, if there is a young patient who should come in, okay, we could occupy the bed, but what about the patient who just came before? 69 or 79 with decompensated COPD? Should we say, ah, oh, no, sorry, sorry, no, no bed available? Or maybe we should advance the discharge of another patient to the floor with some risk with some risk for that patient. But that is distributive justice. The public very often doesn't know much about it. But today, we may be called from the floor. Do you have some beds available? Yeah, it's okay. Oh, good. Let me tell you. I am here at 78. Or if we say, Oof, we are so busy. Oh, okay, okay. I had an elderly patient here, but we will try to manage. In some countries, as I alluded to, they may apply life support on the floor. In Israel in particular, it's not uncommon to use mechanical ventilation on the floor, especially in elderly patients. That's not desirable, of course. But think at the COVID-19 crisis. We need to say one word about it, of course. And that's uh, what I spoke about 10 years ago, I think, or five years ago, I don't remember, when I spoke at the academy about epidemics. And then, of course, the reality came to us. But would you start mechanical ventilation in an elderly patient with frailty, with comorbidities? Maybe not. So we need to select triage, I don't like the word, but that's the word we use, triage patients, <clears throat> before ICU admission. Read this <clears throat> from a, an English newspaper. A 90-year-old woman dies from coronavirus in Belgium after refusing a ventilator and telling doctors, I had a good life, keep this for the younger. But some patients cannot express that. We need to have a plan. We need to discuss a plan in advance because without the plan, we could do like in Italy at the beginning, in Northern Italy, they just admitted patients in the ICU without triage. And then the ICUs were full. There was no room for the other ones. So we need to have uh, some factors that will help us to decide, and of course, it could be on the basis of acceptable criteria, not on moral values, your friendly colleagues or whatever, we can take only some elements into account. And age is an important one, but of course, not the only one. And this should be transparent. So we could use a score in this type of uh, situation in pandemics. And this is the scores we have used in the hospital here in Brussels. Uh, part of it is in, uh, well, it, it is in French actually, but we can understand it's a frailty score associated with a list of comorbidities. And so we can prioritize admissions. 
And if the ICU is full, I'm sorry, we cannot say, what can I do? The ICU is, no, 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 no. And first come, first served principles should not be applied. The lottery should not be applied. Hopefully, this was very well stressed in this review article in the New England Journal of Medicine, where it was argued that we should not apply the principle of the first come, first serve. And lottery doesn't make sense because it's not just two patients for one bed. Again, these are very dynamic problems with patients who should be perhaps discharged from ICU to admit someone else. Or perhaps we should stop our efforts in some patients to admit others. So these are very complex situations, of course, but we need to give up. And when we give up in these conditions, in some patients, I think, I think that's my opinion, that we need to do it fast because the bed should be quickly available to save someone else. It should be pretty fast in these conditions of pandemics. And if there is no ECMO available, if a patient has been on this extracorporeal systems for a while without improvement, we may have to stop it and use the respiratory support in someone else. That's distributive justice. May be very difficult for younger physicians in particular, need of resources for someone else. That's hard to apply. So the team should be around with a senior staff doctor. There may be a need for a psychologist. That's what I wrote in The Lancet quite a while ago. I said, how could patients die of COVID? It's usually when we decide not to apply, not to admit the patient in the ICU, not to start mechanical ventilation, not to start ECMO. No patient should die of respiratory failure from COVID in the era of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. But when you start ECMO, you may try to help one person, but the staff will be very busy with the ECMO and others may actually be treated less well. So these are very important decisions for the entire population being in the IC. And of course, COVID-19 does not prevent admission of other patients. Also in Italy at the beginning, there was this problem. Oh, I cannot admit your patient. I mean, I have plenty of COVID patients who must come to the ICU. Wait a minute. There are peritonitis, there are peristoma, there are other things. Never, never give up. Of course, Winston Churchill didn't speak about the end of life. Let's speak about how patients die in the ICU. We know now that in more than 80% of the cases, it's because we put some therapeutic medications. In the vast majority of cases, sometimes people die despite our full support, but it's relatively uncommon. So I already spoke a little bit about withholding and the typical withholding decision is not to do anything in case of cardiac arrest. Do not resuscitate. Or as I introduced in Belgium many years ago, not to be resuscitated, NTBR. Cardiac arrest would be a natural death. But it's not sufficient. In some other patients, we may decide even not to intubate the trachea or not to start dialysis or not to transfer to ICU because the patient is in a advanced state or very old, or sometimes we decide not to do any escalation, DNE, do not escalate. And this should be clarified. When there was the, the paper charts, we used to have, and I introduced it, a green sheet where all of this was written and signed by a senior doctor. Sometimes in the ICU, we need to withdraw life support stop mechanical ventilation, stop dialysis, stop vasopressor. Can we do that? Is there an ethical difference between the two? 
Well, in the Western world, we usually agree that there is no difference. And ethically, we have this illustration. If we refer to mechanical ventilation, withholding mechanical ventilation would mean not to use mechanical ventilation from now on. Withdrawing is also the decision not to use mechanical ventilation from now on. So it's the same therapeutic decision for the next minute or the next hours. So in Belgium, we had this statement already 20 years ago. There is no ethical or moral difference between withholding and withdrawing life support, even though withdrawing, stopping, is sometimes more difficult practically. Yeah, that's our knowledge there. But it is just as acceptable not to start than to stop mechanical ventilation, artificial ventilation, as we used to say many years ago. Because if this was forbidden, first of all, we would hesitate to escalate because we could not go back. So that would harm people. And also, we would keep our ICUs busy with people who are just in a hopeless situation. And also, withdrawing may sometimes be better than withholding, you know, if we decide not to intubate the trachea. And if the patient is in distress with a mask, which is not very helpful, it's terrible. Or if we decide not to use vasopressors, but the patient is profoundly hypotensive, maybe it could be worse for the organs. So, symmetry is a one-way road, and we were the first to propose the ICU test, or the ICU trial, as some others said later. It means that we would admit a patient in the ICU to try to do something just for two or three days because we hesitate. This patient is elderly, there's a past history, but you know, if we withhold, the patient will definitely die. Whereas if you start to do something, to try something, maybe the patient will get better. Otherwise, we will stop. But we must be allowed to withdraw therapy. So in a way, it gives more chances between brackets to the patient. But it's not easily applied. And we should, of course, speak about it with the relatives. So what about terminal sedation? Something that we very often apply in Belgium because we think that the patient could be maintained on mechanical ventilation to avoid any suffering, and we would administer large doses of uh, opiates and uh, sedatives. Maybe preferable to prevent any discomfort at the end result would be the same. Again, with our Belgian society, we say it, it's difficult to establish a coherent distinction between increasing analgo sedation even substantially while maintaining life support and the discontinuation of life support. We went further with our, with our Belgian society. We published this paper when I was president of the society. And we said, you know, in Belgium, we do regularly shorten the dying process of some patients who are at the end of uh, their life, even in the absence of discomfort, even in the absence of discomfort. So that's, I think, a very strong statement. And uh, of course, we discuss it, and it should be understood by the relatives. But the relatives should understand that the final decision is not theirs. In the US, it may be different. In Europe, or at least in Belgium, we feel that this is a medical decision. Some people don't like it, and this is a recent response to a so-called consensus paper where they say the doctor should never hasten death. We say, wait a minute. Isn't it ethically advisable 
to prevent any suffering at the end of life? Oh, in Belgium, we have a law on euthanasia. No, 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 this is not related to the law on euthanasia. On the contrary, we do not have much to protect us in these many cases where we hasten death with medications. What we could call terminal sedation, it is allowed in France, but it is not explicitly allowed in Belgium. But I think we must put some limits to our treatment. We should say that withdrawing may be necessary, and too often doctors cannot decide who will see tomorrow, who will see tomorrow. That's not a good idea when everybody understands that this is the end. And this is a terrible paper published. I mean, it's a, it's a good paper, but it's a terrible story published in the New England Journal of Medi Medicine the last century, indicating that nurses actually did the job when the doctors didn't want to do the job. It was something really terrible. Of course, it was anonymous, but it tells a very frightening story. So we speak about quality of life, we should speak about quality of death as well. There are many international differences about this, but I see the time is running. But clearly, when you go to the north of Europe, this is much better accepted than in the south of Europe. And I could you know, show differences also with Japan, with Turkey, with other parts of the world. I think it's very interesting in some countries you just cannot withhold. Every patient who needs ICU should go to the ICU even if it's terminal cancer. In some countries, you cannot withdraw. Israel is a good example where they had a law putting timers on ventilators. So the ventilators would stop by themselves after three days, four days, if the patient is not improving. So nobody stops the respirator. The respirator stops by itself because the timer is on. In some cases, you can withhold and you can withdraw, always in some cases, of course, but you should never hasten them. That's in the Anglo-Saxon country. And then in France, in Belgium, Netherlands, it's in some cases, we do increase the dose of sedatives. And I think in Scandinavia, it's done sometimes as well. In France, there was the big story um, about this, but ultimately they got a law which does not allow euthanasia, but it allows the terminal sedation. And the ICU doctors have been very, very pleased to see this class Leonetti law now five years ago. And in, Euro in Europe, we have this statement it may be decided to withdraw or limit a treatment. Quality of life should be taken into account, but they say the use of sedation is a, a, a disputed issue, which is true. It is a disputed issue, but more and more people refer to the right to die around the globe. So when I was president of the World Federation, we tried to give some principles we never stop care, we never withdraw all treatments, and when we withdraw treatment, we do not indeed stop uh, care, and uh, someone could defend or present the patient's opinion about this. Death is too important to be left to doctors. Of course, other team members should be involved, Whenever possible, the patient should be involved. Now, we often refer to the relatives, but the relatives, it's not very well defined, I'm afraid. And, uh, you know, sometimes one relative thinks one thing and the other one thinks another thing. So, and in any case, it's not the relatives who should decide. They should tell us what the patient would have preferred. Sometimes the relatives want everything to be continued, even if there is vegetative state. 
And of course, it's difficult to go against his wishes. We need to talk, we need to discuss, but we would never go against uh, what the patient would have uh, uh, liked. Otherwise, these decisions should be made by a consensus. It's not unanimity. No, no, no. We should have this discussion, very open discussions at the bedside, and that would be the way to uh, decide. I will uh, only touch on autonomy at the very end to say that advanced directives, in my opinion, is sometimes misunderstood. It's important for people to tell what they would prefer, but it can be done overly to someone who could speak for them. But just writing it, it may not be a good idea. And I like this very recent paper showing that at the end, having written advanced directives does not change exactly what we do because it very much depends on uh, what the patient has. If there is severe traumatic brain injury in an elderly patient, advanced directives will not change the situation, which is hopeless. But if it's pneumonia, need for mechanical ventilation, this is not futile necessarily. So even if there are advanced directives, maybe we could try to have some support. So I realize that, uh, that my time is over, but I think it should be, I think, discussed by others and we should uh, spend the time about this. It should not go to court. These are ethical matters that could be managed in the ICU. Legally, it's what we call the state of necessity. We didn't kill anybody. We accompanied someone at the end of his life. There is nothing to hide. We are doing the right thing. So the goal of medicine is to improve, restore the well-being. The idea is to die young as late as possible. That's a good, good thing. And um, I like to insist on this concept of quality of death as well. Therapeutic limitations are often applied in the ICU, and they are part of the therapeutic plan. There are medical decisions, and they should be regularly reevaluated. Life support can be discontinued, but never patient care. And the doctors ought to acquire the skills to bestow the attention whereby the dying may pass more easily and quietly out of life. You know how he called it? Of course, it was euthanasia, a term that we prefer to avoid in intensive care medicine because it has a bad connotation. But etymologically, having a good death is something that we would like to have. The health of my patient will be my first consideration. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I went a little bit over time. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vincent, for this great talk. Um, you evoked a lot of thoughts here. And um, uh, maybe I, I would like to start with uh, a question which relates to um, um, how to, and I mean, you are emphasizing how complex uh, this problem is. So my, 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 but my question is in when you do studies of some kind of improvement where the improvement not necessarily is a novel intervention. It could be not to do something or to, to uh, stop doing something at the ICU, but you would like to measure the, the, the preferable outcome of the patient. And, um, and uh, you would maybe like to monitor accarnement from the physicians uh, as, as a bad factor in this, uh, in this uh, uh, follow-up, so to say. So, w what do you believe is the b maybe the best way to, to do these kind of studies to capture the um, effect of improvement of care in a study? What would be like the outcome, given the, 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 the different conditions of the patients, the different wishes of the patients, making this extremely difficult to measure 
um, uh, so, so this is probably a difficult question, but what w I take the chance to, to give it to you. No, no, sure. No, no, I, I think it's an excellent question. And um, the, um, the problem is that it's very difficult to objectively define futile therapy or acharnement therapeutic. When does it really start? Because you and I, we may have a different view on this when we are at the bedside. And you may say, oh, all of this is futile from now on. And I may say, well, wait a minute. I have known a patient who was in this condition last year, and this patient actually got better. So it may not be futile. So how can we reconcile this, uh, this element? And that's the reason why I briefly alluded to the consensus element. It's not you and I only. What do the nurses think? What do the physiotherapists think? Physiotherapists. Well, the physiotherapist spends some time with the patient trying to do some exercise, and they can sometimes bring some important information about perhaps how the patient reacts to that, if the patient is not deeply comatous, of course. Um, and, uh, of course, interactions with the family uh, is very important because futile therapy may not be there, if the patient has always wanted to stay alive, and if the patient was really against any form of uh, uh, therapeutic limitation for religious reasons or whatever, versus another patient who would have said, oh, please, if I am in a bad condition, let me go, let me go. That's, of course, very different. So uh, I represented this image which I often do, the patient is at the center of our preoccupations. And there are doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, psychologists, relatives. We are all together trying to make the best for the patient, for the patient's well-being. And it's from that that we should have the best decision. And how can we objectivate it, as it was part of your question? I think by an inquiry about satisfaction. Satisfaction of first the relatives. How did they think we managed things? Are they happy with the end of life process? And of course, we also need to inquire how all the staff members um, really like or dislike uh, what we have done. And, you know, it's a common experience in many ICUs, including ours, that the relatives are usually happier about the care in the ICU when the patient died than when the patient survived. Can you believe that? But that's true. The families come to you when the patient died and they say, you know, you provided a wonderful care. You tried what, we could, what you could, but then there was a quality of death. Whereas when the patient gets better, they tend to forget about the ICU. That was a bad period. Oh, no, 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 it was terrible. You know, with all these machines, oh, no, no, no. no. So it, it's quite interesting to see that um, the, the, the family members should be satisfied with the care we provide in all conditions, of course, but sometimes they are even more grateful when the patient died than when the patient survived. You know, I, I, I'm a bit provocative here. Of course, they are very grateful when the patient did better. But uh, towards the, uh, the, the ICU staff, they usually express more gratitude in these very sad conditions when the patient didn't make it. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a question. It's impossible not to touch on the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, I've been following the results from all countries <laughs> around the world with great interest the last year. Uh, and you in Belgium has been substantially struck by this pandemic, just as Sweden has. Uh, and if, we, if you only look at the death rates uh, within each country, uh, Belgium stood out as one of the worst hit countries in the in the beginning and also towards like the middle uh, do you think that the way that you have brought forth the ICU thinking of quality of, of death distributive justice the way that you have been managing to see who can actually survive this and not have affected that changing the ways of work so to speak 
Well, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question, <clears throat> but very complex one because, as you know, uh, many patients who died during the first wave in Belgium were indeed elderly living in nursing homes and um, dying in their nursing homes uh, because they were uh, clearly at the end of their lives. Uh, in terms of uh, <clears throat> uh, ICU beds, we have not been in a too bad situation because we have a relatively reasonable number of ICU beds in Belgium. We have much more ICU beds than in the Netherlands or in France, for instance. And so we sometimes it was very difficult to find a bed, but we did not have to make too tough decisions uh, when, uh, when, uh, when it was a, a question of ICU admission. So triage was not too bad. It was not like in Italy or in London or in New York uh, later or in uh, Madrid or in Paris and still now in Paris, it's quite difficult as you know. So, uh, but your question very specifically is also, did you, do you give up perhaps um, a, a bit easily uh, in, uh, in, or more easily than in other places? Well, perhaps, because we have this system where we very openly discuss these issues, but I think it's not very different in, um, in, in Sweden, but I do not have the data to demonstrate it, but I think in, uh, in Scandinavia, people are quite reasonable, as we are in Belgium, in terms of therapeutic limitations. And so, indeed, when there was a patient uh, very elderly, again, with some dementia or advanced atherosclerosis, severe heart failure uh, coming in, either we would not admit the patient in the ICU or we would do an ICU test and we would keep the patient for a couple of days in the ICU and if there is no substantial improvement, we would actually give up. Mm. But that's something that in the south of Europe, and I'm thinking at the north of Italy in particular, when there was this terrible, terrible situation, um, they were not prepared for it, not prepared ethically either, because it's difficult in a country which is very Catholic, where ending life support is a very difficult thing. If a nurse goes to the police mentioning that, it could be terrible because at court, the doctors could <clears throat> definitely be found guilty for stopping treatment in a patient. So that's an impossible situation. So hopefully, in Belgium, we did not have uh, such a complex uh, situation, but it could have occurred if the wave uh, would have been even worse with uh, somewhat younger uh, people. Of course, we could have uh, had this as in New York or in mm. London. Yeah, yeah, I, I think. Uh... I mean, I think we have quite the same system as you do in Belgium. One of the questions that we've had in, in Sweden has been, if we get a full ICU, and I, I saw that you, you showed the uh, clinical frailty scale as one of the measures on how, how to determine which, will have a, which patient will have a successful outcome or better or worse probability of a su su successful outcome. Do you, have you been using that as a tool for when to decide which patients should be dismissed or stopped or withdrawal. Uh, do you use those tools as well in that order, not only for admission, but also for discharge? Actually, I would say rather no, but you know, I, I am not really fond of scores, even though, as you know, I, I, I participated in the development of the SOFA score. Uh, for organ dysfunction, but uh, I'm not fond of scores. We do not calculate any Apache or mm -hmm. subscore in patients who come in the ICU, and we would never use a score for um, discontinuation of treatment because, again, it's it's too complex for yeah. us. It's not, you know. We don't need a frailty score to realize that the patient is frail, but that <laughs> that comes from a discussion that we can have. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> you know, in a couple of days, I will speak about artificial intelligence in uh, in medicine, and artificial intelligence will uh, really uh, help us to put it together a bit better. 
but the doctor will have more time to talk to the families, and we should find time to talk to the patient, and when it's not possible to talk to the family, and when it's possible to talk to the patient, we should also talk to the family, but we should spend time on this, mm. and sometimes people are too busy, and that's very bad, because that leads to very bad situation, conflicts, um, it's, it's, it's terrible. So let's organize our work to find time to talk to the patient and talk to the relatives. Thank you. Yes. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Vincent, uh, for this. And, 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 and we will um, talk uh, on another meeting in about an hour. But for now, I'd like to, to thank you very much for your participation here. And we will move on to the, to the next speaker who will be presented by Freddy. Thank you very much. Sure. And then I, uh, I hope that we have Antonio Vaz Carniero with us uh, from Portugal. Hello, yes. Antonio. Hello, good morning. Good morning. I hope you have a very nice weather in Portugal. Not really, unfortunately. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> We're really looking forward to your talk. And uh, Dr. Carniero is a professor of medicine in Lisbon and also been the chair of the Cochrane Institute in Portugal. And you have, a have had a long and successful career in both Portugal and the US. Uh, and we met a couple of times in the uh, European Federation of Internal Medicine. So with no further ado, Antonio, the floor is yours. And you're going to talk about modern healthcare and what we actually do for the patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello, good morning, everybody. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Dr. Ole Melander by his kind invitation and all the organizing committee of this symposium to have me here. It's, a, it's an honor and it's a pleasure to be here with you, even though we are just online uh, and I would rather be in Sweden, uh, I'm afraid this is, has, to, has to be done. Now, uh, in the next 40 minutes, I'll, I, will, I will try to, um, to address a few points uh, that are actually of concern with this symposium. The title that uh, I'm going to share this. Let me just share the screen with my talk. And now let me ask you if you can you see my slide? It's coming. Yes. Yes. Is that okay? Okay, great. So the title that was given to me was Multimorbidity in Modern Medicine and Are We Really Doing It for the Patient? And so, but you know, there are several ways that we could address this question. Uh, but I, you know, given the general topic of the, of, the, of the meeting, I decided to go in a specific way. And then I'd like to, in the end, to have a, a couple of questions and dialogue with you. Now, first of all, I don't, I don't have any conflict of interest uh, to, to give this talk. And these are my views and not of the organization of which I belong, which is the University of Lisbon School of Medicine and the Cochrane in Portugal. Now, let me start by reading you a paper that was published in 2015. The object of these researchers was basically to analyze mortality and treatment differences among patients admitted with acute cardiovascular conditions during date of national cardiology meetings in the US compared with non-meeting dates. So it was a retrospective analysis of 30-day mortality among Medicare beneficiaries hospitalized with acute MI, heart failure, or cardiac arrest, in other words, high-risk patients, from 2002 all the way to 2011, and they compared during dates of two national cardiology meetings compared with identical non-meeting days in the three weeks before and after the conferences. Now, basically, between the meeting and non-meeting dates, the baseline risk of the patients was the same. Okay, they have the same demographic characteristics and they end the same existing medical conditions. Uh, they ask, they, uh, they, they were also, uh, in terms of risk stratification, very similar. Okay. Patients with acute MI and heart failure have, the, using the ARC risk tool, pretty much the same baseline risk. So we could say uh, that these are very, very similar patients in which the only difference is between they've been treated between the times that the cardiologists are away in the meetings and the, 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 on, on the time that the, the hospital is running basically normally, okay? The patient characteristics were also similar between meeting and non-meeting dates for high-risk patients for the teaching and non-teaching hospitals, okay? 
And so they look, basically what they're saying is, let's see if there's any change in mortality in high-risk patients admitted during, at, at a time where most of, of interventional cardiology and cardiologists are away, as compared when they are working on a, on a routine or every day. And what you can see here is divided by two baseline risks, low predictive mortality and high predictive mortality, that the patients basically that were uh, admitting during the meetings at a lower uh, average mortality on, on, on the 30 days. In other words, people die less when the cardiologists are, are away when they are present. And this is a, 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 an acute myocardial infarction. There was not a big difference. There was in heart failure and cardiac arrest. When you look at low predictive mortality, low risk patients, then you couldn't find any difference. And the authors just conclude that high risk patients with heart failure and cardiac arrest hospitalized in teaching hospitals at lower 30-day mortality when admitted during dates of national cardiology meetings. And high risk, I didn't discuss it, but high risk patients with QTMI admitted to teaching hospitals did receive less PCI, but interestingly enough, without any impact on mortality. So there you go. This is a very interesting phenomenon, actually has been reproduced in other studies and kind of makes you wonder what are the reasons? We don't have time to be speculating about the reasons here. These are just facts, but certainly it's something that we should think about. So what would plan am I, am I, am I this brief talk? First of all, I would like, I would like to exchange with you the concept of value-based healthcare and typology of practice. We will talk a little bit of variation of care. We will, we will speak about disease definition for uh, uh, as, as, a, a, as a, a proxy, as, as almost a proxy to, to define medical access. We will talk a little bit about geriatric patients over treatment. That was the title of my talk. We will then go over the post-pandemic world and why our approach should be different. And I'll give you a quick example on the idea that maybe with some more information, we can turn around this situation. Maybe, okay? Now, the concept of value-based health care has come from Michael Porter, as, as everybody knows, and is simply a reason, a, a, a rate between outcomes and costs. The outcomes are inherently condition-specific and multidimensional, and the costs are looking at the full cycle of, of, of the care, okay? And based on this, in other words, based on the, the relationship between outcomes that matter to patients, and costs that 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 that, that are that are assumed by the system. That's how we define the the, the type of care that we are giving. In true and basically classically, and these are the dark mode atlas atlas project. These are the people that best study variation in care. They define this in three different types of of, 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 of care. Underuse, in which. This includes discontinuity of care and lack of systems that would facilitate the appropriate use of these, uh, these services. In other words, this is a service that the care that everybody should have. The misuse, in which we have several options, but not only we take the, be the best option and the, the topic of this meeting, the overuse. And this is the that, and if you don't want to, to look at this this way by classifying this way, we have we have we are in trouble. We cannot figure out exactly how to do it. Now one of the conditions that, one of the reasons that we obviously, it's very tempting to say, is that, you know, we are, uh, uh, we are uh, witnessing overuse because we give a lot of resources. So the more the resources, the maybe that's one of the reasons. Up until now, what we felt was, you know, these are several studies in which it, where they, they are trying to relate the patient outcomes results with healthcare spending. And, and this goes from very low levels of healthcare spending to very high level of healthcare spending. And as you can see, there are several points on this curve. As you increase healthcare spending, the quality of care also increases. And this is the, the point A that represents high value of care as spending leads to big gains in outcomes. As you go forward with spending, the point B, and, and this one is, for example, public sanitation, vaccinations, et cetera. As you go further on, on spending, the, the point B represents intermediate levels of gain based on additional spending. We are not gaining that, that much anymore. And that goes, for example, a lot of what is our management on an everyday basis. But if we keep putting money in the system, then the curve flattens out. And uh, point C represents low value care in which additional spending is not associated 
with significant improvement in patient outcomes. Now, these authors didn't do this that last part. This was me just to show that if we really keep pushing the financing of the system, then we start getting deleterious effects. Mortality goes up, the morbidity goes up. And this is really very interesting because I would say that probably most people are deeply convinced that the relation between funding and quality is a direct relation. The more funding I, I, I will provide to the system, the higher the quality of care. And these studies show that really this is not really um, the, 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 the reality. So the question is, where do I stop? And of course, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do this. Of course, we should do this. But just to make sure that we are, when we are allocating resources, we have to have in mind this, this type of graphics. I keep hearing in my country that, you know, Portugal should invest more in health. We are investing too little. Okay, but what, where, on what, what field? And that this is really important uh, to go forward because we know that the, our impact of our, of our actions, we know that uh, in terms of, uh, of the results that we expect, uh, the, low, the higher the risk, the better the therapy. In other words, the, 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 the high risk patients, we should go ahead and treat them. They, they, they don't really give us too much problems. There's a net benefit of the diagnosing and treatment and treating those patients correctly. The problem comes of the low risk patients. In other words, the problem comes when the patients have a, an excellent prognosis and then I'm trying to interfere on that base life risk, trying to improve that excellent prognosis. And that's the point that we, in which we can classify them in low value. In other words, it's a small net benefit compared with arms. And so this classification of baseline risk is really important uh, for us to, uh, to, to, to look at this problem, this global problem of overuse and uh, uh, of resources. Now, variation of care, as you know, is been defined by you know, diagnosing and, treat them, and treating patients differently where they, when their, their clinical presentation and their baseline risk is the same, all right? And this has to do with, so, uh, with a lot of, 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 of reasons, but what you are looking at is the same patients in, with the same diseases with the same baseline risk of so the same severity are, are diagnosed and treated differently from, part, from country to country and within the same country from the different parts of the same country, okay? This is the OECD report precisely on this subject that was published in, in a few years ago in which they went to look at a whole bunch of, 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 uh, of uh, countries uh, uh, looking at several measures of, of utilization. And what I'm showing you here is we have these are the countries that they, that, that they reported, and, and we are looking at medical admission rates. Now, medical admission rate is a very important measure for, uh, for uh, uh, service utilization, for resource utilization. And certainly, we, we should think that the criteria to admit somebody should be specifically enough and rigorously enough to not see what we are seeing here, in which the standardized rates for 100 population are widely dispersed within the same country. These are different regions than you see, that we can see that we, we in Portugal have a lower standardized rate, but even in that lower standardized rate, there is a significant uh, um, um, variation. And when compared, for example, in Germany, we tend to admit a third of the patients that Germans admit. But even the Germans have quite a variation between the parts of Germany. I'm just giving you these examples because if you're going to look at this, you're going to find this pretty much on every single study ever done on variation of care. And, and variation of care has nothing to do specifically with, with, with the, 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 the volume of resources being very high. No, no, we can find this on low-income countries as well. Now, when you look at specific intervention, high complexity specific intervention like the PTCA, and you look at standard, again, standardized rates of population by 100,000 population, you also see huge changes. All right, there are not one single point. If the criteria to apply PTCA would be carefully followed, then they would all cluster around an average and this variation will be very small. But when you look at the PCA, this is exactly what you see. And, uh, and, and you ought to see all, in all countries a more or less wide variation. Now, what about in my country? 
When you look at all, a whole bunch of, in, of, of interventions in care, you always find the same thing. Around an average, there's a wide variation in both senses. In other words, we are either overdoing it or, or underdoing it because the, the, we shouldn't expect these big changes in, uh, in, in interventions, okay? Now, when you look at this graphically, and, and this is my country, this is a small country, and that, as you can see, when you look at the, this is the geographic variation, okay, between 2002 and 2010, and these are medical admission standardized rates, and what you can see is there are parts in Portugal that admit twice to three times more than others. In such a small country, we are about, about 10.5 million people, in such a small country, it's very puzzling that certain areas of the interior are admitting two to three more times uh, uh, patients than the average, the national average. And we need to, to think about this because this is a, 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 a point that, that helps us to think ab about the, the overuse, the underuse, and the misuse. Because we have to say that if these if this admissions here near Spain are appropriate, then these admissions are well inappropriate because people should be more in the hospital. On the other hand, if we believe that the right, the right uh, standards rate are correct here, then we, sh we should recognize that we have a problem here. We are way over admitting people to the hospital. And as you know, the hospital is not a good place for one to be. We, we only have to be in the hospital when we need. There are plenty of dangers in the hospital. And of course, for, for many, many years now, we try to, to, to discharge our patients as fast as we can. So this, this, this analysis is important for us to think globally, not specifically for each one of us, but globally. What are the patterns of care and how can I learn from those patterns of care in terms of trying to define Remember the, the definition I gave you, misuse, underuse, and overuse, okay? Now, one of the things that are really interesting is important is this definition in medical access. Of course, we, 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 we treat people, that's why year four, but we treat people because we have, these people have diseases. And we say they have diseases because we have patterns and we have data to classify them as such, okay, All right? Uh, now let me bring you some. Is this the right way? Of course it is. But let me get, let me raise a few problems about disease definition and change in prevalence of disease. Okay, this is a study done by the Australians, and in which they aim to identify guidelines in which disease definitions were changed to assess whether any proposed change that would increase the number of individuals considered to have disease, whether potential harms of expanding disease definition were investigated, and the relationship between doctors and the industry ties. They derived a list of common conditions in the US, drawing from a list of 10 most costly adult diseases, the top 20 therapeutic class of drugs, and the top 25 individual drugs by expenditure. Okay? And they identify 16 publications in which expert panels proposed change in 14 conditions. Okay? So what they did well was look at the, at the definition of disease look carefully of, of the high cost, high, 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 high importance disease, either for the cost or for the charge, okay? And, and look at the change in definition, what does that do? And this is the most important table that they'll show us. And they are just saying that the, the, the expansion of disease is done by four, in four ways. Creating new categories of, of pre-disease, pre-hypertension, pre-dementia, Lowering the diagnostic thresholds, I'll show you a little bit more in a minute, okay? Uh, and then uh, doing the diagnostic early with a different diagnostic model. And they have all this type of disease and risk factors that then change the, 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 the way that we do things. And in this other study, that the, what these people did was they, they, they pick up osteoporosis, myocardial infarctions, polycystic ovary syndrome, and prediabetes, they look at the populations defined and the previous definition and the, uh, and the old definition, uh, prevalence definition. And so this was the way that, the, that they were diagnosed. And the prevalence was 21, 18, 7, 26, and 26. And when the new definitions done by these experts were applied, there was an increase, immediately increase in prevalence of disease. In other words, by 
the, by changing the definition of disease, I can augment, I can increase or diminish the prevalence of disease. And then this is a, a very interesting uh, uh, example done by Welch in 1937, in which what you see here on the left hand side is diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and osteoporosis. And these were the change in definition from, from 140 to 126 for diabetes, changing in lowering the, the, the uh, hypertension changing from 240 to 200 milliliters per deciliter for, for the hyperlipidemia and changing the T-score for diagnosis of, of uh, osteoporosis. In the old definition, these were the, the, the raw numbers that exist in the states. With the, new, with the new definitions, there was this increase in numbers with an increase in absolute risk, baseline risk of 14% of diabetes, 35% hypertension, and 86% of hyperlipidemia and osteoporosis, which by changing definition, literally overnight, 86% of more people were eligible to get a statin. And when you look at the way this was done, and this is very interesting, it's a paper from Nature, uh, it was very interesting in which you can see the way that the importance of definition goes as the time goes by, even when not everybody agrees, so that the increase of diabetes, of the prevalence of diabetes rises slowly, but what really rises very significantly is the preconditions. Now, the preconditions have a very, very low risk to actually become the condition. So we are treating people that most likely would not have any problems at all. And this is the problem about overtreatment. We are, when we look at the low risk patients, that's where you get in trouble. Again, remember the, the, the graphic that I show you, the high risk patients, we should go ahead and diagnose and treat. And we are pretty sure that we're gonna get good results. Is the low uh, risk patients in which the benefit risk balance is really very problematic that we should be, should be very careful not to do more harm than good. And of course, during this symposium, a lot of people already spoke about this. I'm not going to, to bother you with, with this, uh, with this uh, um, uh, details. Now, overtreatment geriatric patients is obviously a, a major, a major important issue. Everybody knows about the, the problems that the, 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 the elderly people have. The, the, they are very important because they are growing every single day all around the world. They are becoming more and more relevant for the national health systems. Pretty much most of the, of the, of the care is, is going to go to this uh, population. And of course, with the expectancy of life going further, we should have more uh, problems, more, 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 more approach like this. In other words, we should expect that uh, as, as the years go by, people will live longer and hopefully we'll live with higher quality of life. And that means that the, the percentage of population with more than 80 years, it's really becoming very important. So these are the elderly elders. And we like to call it this way. And of course, even the concept of functionality have been changing. Now we feel that 70 year old may be statistically old, but most of the time they are, you know, they are not old at all. They are very autonomous people. But when you go further, what you see here is in a whole bunch of these countries, the percentage of very old people tend to rise and tend to rise because of several reasons, of course, because, you know, um, good, good um, levels of, of care uh, good for socioeconomic conditions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is good. In other words, we are having a success in terms of, uh, of, uh, um, of t uh, taking care of these people. After all, they get to 80. In, in, in my country, if you were born in the year 900, okay, one in the, year in the beginning of the 20th century, if you were a baby girl, you should expect to live 42 years. If you were a, a baby boy, you should expect to live about 38 years. A, a, a baby girl that is born today in my country, you should expect to live 86 years. And if it's a boy, about 79 to 80 years. So we gain 50 years of expectancy of life here, uh, life over this period of time, which is really, really, really remarkable. Again, a lot of preventive measures, a lot of socioeconomic development, but the, it's the drugs, it's the, the intervention, it's the medical intervention that actually makes the difference. I need much more drugs when I'm 80 years old than when I'm 40 years old. So this is good. This is a positive thing. This is actually a very important metric. 
but it raises its own its own its own problems. Let me show you here, for example, that one of the problems that we have is the oldest older do not get into clinical trials. In other words, uh, there, there is a problem in which getting trials that are representative of very old people. Of course, the reasons are very understandable. They are the people that are frail, that they have high high, high death rates. Nobody wants to design a, a a clinical trial and then see quickly start pe the people dying quickly. So we, we understand that it's a question of safety as well. But in so doing, we don't have information to actually treat appropriately these people. And we have to extrapolate from younger groups that were studied into the old groups. And what we see here is basically uh, 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 in uh, the, 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 the difference between treatment drugs that were approved on clinical trials in which when you're young, most of the drugs are carefully based on the best evidence. But if you go to older people, you, you, lo you lose this kind of uh, reality. Most people here are, uh, are not treated with the drugs from, the, from the clinical trials precisely because of the reasons that I, I just mentioned, okay? And of course, when you look at different uh, risk factors uh, for old people, we know that the older you are, the more comorbidities you're gonna have. That's a law of life. There is no way that you can escape that. The older you are, you may be a very health, uh, old people, uh, old person, but you're still gonna have comorbidities. So, we are trying to do, and sometimes we are tempted to do, is to treat everything. You know, in other words, I will look at my patients, I'll try to look at what is normal and abnormal, and I'll try to, to correct what is abnormal. Very simple. Does this have consequences? This is a study uh, published in General American Genetic Society in which the, the authors trying to uh, respond to the question if there was an association between mortality and glycemic control blood pressure levels and cholesterol levels in patients with type 2 diabetes who are, who are older than 80 years, okay? This was a, a cohort prospective population-based study. These authors evaluate the population-based primary care database in the US where they identified 26,000 patients older than 80 years old and with type 2 diabetes. And in this database include a lot of stuff, a lot of good information. And they look at it also for the comorbidities, clinical data, comorbidities, number of office visits, in other words, the, the, the utilization of care, classes of prescribed med medication, smoking status, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is a typical study, big data study. And what did they, they found? Well, approximately all from the cohort were women, one third have coexisting cardiac disease and about half have diabetes for more than 10 years. So this was a high risk patients. If you look at the baseline risk of these patients, we know that they are not, they are high risk patients or moderate to high risk patients, okay? About, uh, approximately 10% of the patients were older than 90 years and there was a median of two hours follow-up during which about 4,500 of these patients died. So it's natural. The, the, the attrition rate of this population is very high. So, you know, it, we, we have to, to, to think about it when you look at treating old people. What is the possibility? What is the life expectancy of this person, okay? And uh, they uh, estimated the mortality as just in for, for variety of factors, including age, sex, and duration of diabetes. And uh, uh, the, the, their conclusions was actually similar to other studies. The relationship between mortality and glycemic control by, uh, used by HbA1c and blood pressure levels follow the U-shaped pattern with another for the glycaid hemoglobin between 7 and 7.5, and for blood pressure between 150 and 90, and 155 and 95. And for each of these, the mortality progressively worsened with lower HbA1c and lower blood pressure levels. And the relationship between total cholesterol and mortality was more curvilinear, with the highest mortality associated with the lowest cholesterol levels and then a sympathetic decrease in cholesterol level increase. So you see, it looks like we are overdoing it here. You know, everything else being the same, if we overtreat these people, we tend to, in to increase their mortality rates. And that, and these are the type of studies that we need. I'm not going to show you another one. And this paper, this paper, this was the whole, you know, the well-known all hat LL3 uh, trial in which they try, they, 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 they examined statin treatment among adults aged 65 to 74 and 75 or older in the, in the um, all hat LLT, okay? 
Then the post hoc secondary data analysis were conducted for participants 60 years or older without evidence of atherosclerotic vascular disease. So this was somewhat a moderate to, to low risk people. They, uh, they identified 2,867 ambulatory adults with hypertension and without baseline atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And they, 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 and the study was between admi administrating prevastatin and usual care. And the primary outcome was all cause mortalities. And the result was the RDAS ratio for all cause mortality in prevastatin group versus the usual care group was 118 for all adults 65 or older, 108 for adults 65 to 74, and 134 for uh, older adults 55 or more. And interestingly enough, the coronary heart disease event rates were not significantly different from, from these two groups. And this is really interesting. When you look at the, at, at the graphic the depiction of this, what do you see? You see that when people are younger, then the, 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 the intervention with pravastatin is pretty much similar with your usual care when you're younger. But when you get to be older, then there is a significant difference in which the incidence of treatment will actually will, will increase the cumulative event rate. And this is really, really puzzling. And in a certain way, should give us pause to think. What, uh, in the, at the end of the day, are we trying to do? And although, although there are several systematic reviews looking at this, uh, at this uh, area, and I didn't bring them, of course, because I I, we, we, we will have no time to, you know, to present them, but there are plenty of systematic reviews consistently showing this, we still see a lot of very old people uh, getting their statins and, and they're trying to be treated aggressively. And so this should kind of, uh, uh, of, of, of open our minds to the next step. And the next step should be deprescribing. If we feel that this is a problem and detecting this is no problem, the problem is, is what are we going to do? And this is the people from the stop criteria, and I'm sure that you are uh, familiar with it, that try to answer the question, are potentially inappropriate medicine as defined by the stop criteria associated with avoidable adverse drug events in older people with acute illness? Of the six standing consecutive patients older than 65 admitted for an acute illness, nearly 25% had one or more adverse drug events. Two thirds of the drug events contributed to the admission. So the hydrogeny of older people is really, really, really high. Why? But they, it's also avoidable. 65, 69% of that would be avoidable. So patients taking medicine at least in 65 rules of the stop, uh, of the stop scale criteria were significantly more likely to experience a drug event. And then of course, we, we, we think, all right, we have identified the problem. What are we going to do about it? And of course, the answer would be we should lower the intensity of care of these people. And you also lower the intensity of preventive intervention in these people. Well, this is easier to say than done, as, you, as, you, as I'm, sure, I'm sure you're fully aware. But there are some schemes that we can use. This is a paper published in BMJ a couple of years ago, in which what they look at was shared decision making about the prescribing. This is really very difficult to do. And it's very difficult to do because the patients actually feel that they may be undertreated if we lower it down, or the families may feel that we are doing a poor job. Of course, I understand this. I, you know, the li life is not easy. Clinical practice is not simple. We should get into every, uh, every factor on our decision. But I brought you this here because we, this is show very nicely the two steps, the two parts of the problem, the, pa the patient and the clinicians, and shows you also how difficult it is, and, uh, and, uh, and it's a stepwise procedure, how difficult it is to deprescribe. Of course, this is the right way to go. This is a way of doing it, but please bear in mind that it's not going to be easy. Because of course, if I give a drug, a statin to a patient of mine and he gets a very serious complication, gets into the hospital, nobody will blame me. But if I take away that drug from cholesterol and the patient has a myocardial infarction, I'll be blamed. So I understand this. I understand this very well. I'm just telling you that we should go on a systematic approach to this type of, uh, of problems. 
Now I'm almost through. I would like just finish by uh, showing you, oh, well, you know, just bring you me a, as a bit of a discussion, uh, the post pandemic world. Uh, things have changed. The world has changed. And now I think we have to face in, a, in quite a different way, the reality. And I think we have an opportunity here to diminish the low value practice. Let me just, you know, over the top of my head, some of the problems that I see. First of all, we are going to have a huge problem financing healthcare. We spend so much money with this pandemic that it has to infringe on the possibility of financing appropriately our national health systems, okay? The second thing, and we have this amount, this huge amount of patients that were not treated that are now coming back in the next few years for us to take care of them. People that remain at home with the lockdowns or the, 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 the care was not offered and they simply could not uh, get treatment that they deserve. Then we have workforce problems. We need to look at the over-treatment, overwork of all of us. 55% of the Portuguese doctors are in burnout, technically speaking, are in burnout, okay? Then this is already was mentioned in this meeting the, the diminish of clinical autonomy replaced by uh, uh, standardization of care. We hate to see this. When if somebody gets to us doctor and say, we, your autonomy is gonna be diminished, we hate this. But we have to, have to, 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 to keep an open mind because this is going to happen. We are we're going to have to rationalize really, really carefully our, our, our practice. Then of course, the, 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 techni the, the, the technicalities and the inequity and, the, and, and the, is it going, it's going to be a problem. We, we should look into these specific methodologies to, to see how can we do things better. And of course, we are going to need a huge uh, information system. Without a very good database system, I simply don't believe that we'll be able to, to look at what we are doing, to, in, to interfere what we are doing, to measure the change, and then in a kind of a learning health system, go step by step in the future. Life has changed, the reality has changed. It will never be the same as it was before. Let's try to make this a good opportunity to change our practice and especially to diminish low value care. This is also a, a, a paper from the New York, New, 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 New York Journal of Medicine in which these people basically what they did was they look at the targets of, of of this, the organizing health system and, and give some solutions for those. So for example, uh, reopening priorities, which they, they, they have this very interesting concept, do not restart the, the, the low value. So it's really interesting that we, it's a courageous thing. We have to think that this is not an easy thing to do, but classified something of this, do not restart this. It's really a step forward in the, the right direction. I'm, finish, I'm finishing with, a, with, with supporting an idea that probably most of you think, well, in order to solve all these problems that we've been discussing here, maybe information should be enough. If I have high quality scientific information, and if I know how to communicate it, my problem will be solved. Well, maybe yes, maybe not. But let me bring you here this, uh, this uh, problem that is really very, very, it's a very central problem, which is, uh, you know, uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine safety. I went, the, the way that, that we should, this thing should be looked at is a global way on benefit risk. But if you pay attention to the media, everybody's concentrating only on the risk. Nobody speaks about the benefit of getting vaccination. And this group, which is a really a smart, a very smart uh, group from, uh, from Cambridge, and I strongly advise you to go there, just put this on, on the Google and go right into their websites. They, they look at this problem and they say, well, following rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine from AstraZeneca, large scale monitoring has picked up a potential link to a specific kind of blood clots. It's, 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 it's from the cytopenia, as you know, okay? There are also some severe allergic reactions uh, reported, but they are extremely rare, okay? Other side effects are, are so far thought to be short term. And uh, this happens mostly on young people. That's why it's so spectacular. Okay, now they explain to people exactly that the potential benefits of vaccination change according to the, how likely the person is to be exposed to the virus and how likely they are to have a poor outcome of catching the virus. Okay, and, and the potential benefits accrue every day that the person is vaccinated. So the vaccine doesn't stop lowering my, my, my risk at one Wednesday. No, air, from, that, from the next days and weeks and months, the, the, the risk will be lower, okay? 
And in order to show this to people, we, they look at the potential benefits to incidence rates of disease and the potential harms in numbers of cases of blood, of blood clot. So as you can see, this is, this is a balance, a careful balance between benefit and risk. And only doing this way, we can have a clear view of how to use this intervention, okay? And on their graphics, there's fantastic graphics. What you see here is on low risk people, on left hand side is potential benefits, on the right hand side is potential harms. This is mean that 0 0.2 a patient, 0 0.2 patient will have a clot, which means it's five patients for, for every clot. And when you compare low risk, then for every patient, you have 14 people that are uh, prevented to go to mission. People don't get disease and don't get intensive care. But on the right, on the high end, again, we already talked about this, on high risk patients, the impact is really huge. For any uh, small uh, in increase in clots, there's a fantastic and brutal impact on admissions and on death. So basically, this is what I would like, what I thought of, of, of presenting to you. Thank you for your, your attention. I thought that we could just, you know, over give an overview of all these problems. Look not only at overuse, but also about the way that we think about these things. And I I really appreciate your, your attention. And of course, I'm available for any uh, any eventual uh, questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antonio. It's a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one question would be, in the, uh, in the uh, wards of, of ordinary medical facilities in Sweden, we usually see patients that are quite old, and uh, they are on substantial medication, of course, probably the same in Portugal. What are your taking on some of these choosing wisely uh, recommendations are not to prescribe, for example, statins to patients who have a uh, short life expectancy. But after the age of 80, and if you're in a hospital in Sweden, you ha probably have somewhat shorter life expectancy than the general population, of course. Do you think that you, we should stop or just uh, put, take, take them off the statins or take them off some PPIs or some blood uh, hypertensives, uh, antihypertensives? Just, just do that, or should we personalize care for every individual also over the age 80? Yes, we should personalize care for each uh, for each individual. We should uh, we should use the data that is available to us on the big studies, uh, and then take a, a close look at this. I, from the top of my head, I think the numbers are: um, in order to save a life when you're older than 80, you should treat uh, with hyper, with cholesterol treatment or with statins treatment. You should treat 10,000 people. So you have to understand that we, we, we can get information from the groups, from well-designed studies. But at the end of the day, we should look at every single uh, patient of ours because they may be different. If they were the same on the inclusion and exclusion criteria from the clinical trials that study them, then I feel safe of following the results that the clinical trial actually produced. If by any reason they are different, then my certainty of in treating them lowers. And I have to do it in the individual risk assessment. We always have to do an individual risk assessment. And as I told you, it is a difficult thing to do. People, you know, patients and families intend to interpret that when we suggest that we should stop some drugs, that either uh, we are trying to save money or we are don't care about the patients anymore. So there's also a, a kind of information and education for the general population about this that, uh, that is very important. After all, most people think, what's wrong of giving you an extra drug to my patient, to my, my father? What is the problem? So, so it, it, it's a parallel thing. Mm. Information from clinical trials and individual risk assessment. Yes. Thanks, Antonio. I, I have a question on um, the, the data that you showed. Um, I mean, of, of, of on um, variability of uh, different kinds of, of healthcare. I mean, how likely and how long you are hospitalized, or specific interventions like PCI and so on. And obviously, when you look at the differences between European countries, there are. Uh, I mean, there might be many. Uh, country-specific factors and traditions that, that explain this difference. But I was fascinated about the wide 
distribution even within Portugal, for example. Yeah. So my question is, um, do you have any data from these studies to suggest, you know, what are the main uh, explanatory factors for these differences? For example, can you identify uh, urban-rural differences? Can you identify demographic differences? Can you uh, identify socioeconomic uh, differences across your country that, that to a certain degree explain these differences? Or, or what do you believe uh, cause these differences? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, we have the data uh, um, uh, concerning that. And one, uh, and of course, it's a multifactorial uh, problem. There's not one, there is not one single reason for this to happen. But there are very, you know, important ones. First of all, the local culture. In other words, what, what do I mean by this? The local hospital has leaders, and those leaders normally are responsible to establish standards of care. And when the leaders have different opinions about what the interventions are, then you're going to easily find wide, wide differences between approaches to the same kind of patients. You're going to, you're going to detect a high degree of variation in care. In my country, for example, the, on, on, on uh, anti-hypertensive therapy, the, the highest used drug on the northern of the country is different from the middle of the country that is different from the southern of the country. Now we have a, a very homogeneous population, so the baseline risk for coronary artery disease is the same. Why this, this uh, differences? Mostly because it's a local uh, culture. The second thing is lack of information uh, for the doctors. Most doctors feel overwhelmed with the amount of information there is, and they can't get around the problem of trying to pinpoint exactly, exactly what to do. And then, uh, and th that should be basically the 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 the, 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 the two main reasons in my country. But, and there are, but there are others. There are others. There are differences from it from it, for example, between private hospitals and public hospitals. And I think the variation in care of a private or a public hospital is not that different, is the level that it is different. And so there are, this, this, there are plenty of reasons to do that. They were well studied pretty much worldwide. And the, the most important thing for me is that they are very pervasive and difficult to handle. This is really difficult to, to change. But again, if somebody would ask me what would be the most difficult thing to do to change a health system, I would say, change uh, doctors' behavior. I think that is the most difficult part of them all. We are a very sophisticated professional class. We feel that we know everything. We feel that we are the good thing. We are doing the right thing. So we are not really open to a lot of information <laughs> about to change our practice. But if we are, we should show the data. Right. Um... Thank you. And, and, and um, uh, another follow-up on, on the, 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 the low-value care. If, and, and I completely agree there is a problem on all these pre-conditions that you brought up. And let, 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 I mean, just take pre-hypertension or pre-diabetes as an example. I think also that the, the, the problem is that the fluctuation of the fluctuating I mean, if, if, if you're diagnosed properly with diabetes or hypertension, most likely you, you will remain in that condition. Even, you know, you would have a high blood if you weren't treated or high glucose. But in this pre-zone, I guess there is a higher fluctuation. Uh, uh, so you, you, the next day you might be completely normal. And, and, and that's the one problem in confidence for that pre-diagnosis or whatever we should call it. The other one is, of course, when you get up to large proportions of the populations and, and the patient finds out that uh, I'm one out of uh, 35 or 40 percent of the population, 50 percent of the population in my age group who has this condition, it might not be so serious and it might actually give the opposite effect. So. Yeah. Uh, so I completely agree. This, this is low-value care, but where where do you think we should put the money then? I mean, um, uh, in 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 terms of the let, let let's stick to um, so so. Do you find a way then to maybe channelize this money to better treat these hypertensives or diabetes with who remain very hypertensive or uh, hyperglycemic despite uh, many years of treatment or uh, what do you think is the best way to, to, to change from low 
low efficiency care to high efficiency care in this particular setting? Well, the example that you're giving is fully diagnosed people. So these people are sick, they need to be treated, period. There is no question about that. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that why do we say that pre-diabetes and pre-hypertension are probably non-existent? It's because less than 1% of these people actually will progress into full-blown disease. In other words, we'll assume the risks that a full-blown disease, diabetes and hypertension, will bring upon him. And that's why we say that. So if you are going to treat these people, in order to have one, one, uh, to, to have one event, to save one event, we had to treat 99 people don't, uh, that would not have any difference at all. So again, if they are diagnosed, when we, uh, please bear in mind, when we decide to talk with our patients, and agree that you are not going to treat them, in other words, that you are going to, 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 to make a watchful waiting, this has two consequences. First of all, we are not abandoning the patient. As a matter of fact, this gives you much more work than just giving it a pill. It's much more work to follow somebody that we have decided not to treat, to monitor uh, his or her uh, evolution, her path, than just give, a, just give a, a pill and come back in six months. So this is really a, a complex approach. And then again, we need to, using the, 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 the predictive system that we have, and we have plenty of that, Euro score, whatever you want to use, we should stratify individually the risk of our patients. And not only one risk, because I can guarantee you that if I have a, somebody with a very high blood pressure that needs treatment, as compared with uh, somebody else who has three uh, uh, risk factors. He has hypertension, uh, he has cholesterol, and he has uh, di uh, diabetes, or almost diabetes. Oh, but he's not really diagnosed, but he's close to there. The second guy that has the numbers almost normal may have 10 times more risk than the first guy, because the risk factors are additive. In a way, so I should treat that the, the hypertension. Of course I should, it's out of the question, but if, these, this, person, this, people, this person is not that, anti, that hypertensive, but there's two more risk factors, then I have to calculate the global risk and act upon that global risk and not only on the individual risk factor. Great, thank you very much. So, so I think uh, we, 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 uh, we will uh, now uh, are about to, to not only to, 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 to close uh, this session, but the entire meeting. But uh, thank you so so much for your uh, wonderful talk. And thank you for inviting me. And and if, if we we will reconvene on another Zoom link in a, a short while. But I give now. Thank you very much, and I'll give word over to Frederick. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Antonio. And I'll see you la see you later. Uh, so th we've come to the end of our symposia, and I hope that everybody who has been online and watching and listening has learned something. And I think, hopefully, we can all agree that the way that we need to perform our work in the future needs to change somewhat. We've, uh, saw, we've seen that w there are things that are easily done, and then there are things that are a little bit more h hassle to, to, to pull through. Uh, but we as doctors, nurses, entire teams, we have the power to, to change the way that we perform healthcare. care. Uh, we should also bear in mind that even though the, the systems in which we work might be a little bit different on financial standards, most of the time it's uh, the money to finance health care comes from individual people, either by taxing or by out-of-pocket payment. And if we concentrate all those, uh, those uh, financial uh, possibilities into healthcare, we cannot finance a lot of other things. And one thing that we have not really discussed too much here is preventive medicine. And as probably uh, all of you know, uh, if we can get patients to stop smoking, to be less obese, to exercise a little bit more, stay away from drugs, stay in school, Good healthcare, good uh, uh, excuse me, good uh, school uh, educational uh, systems for kids. One of the best ways to save money for the entire society. And then, first, first, then can we really do the best way for all our for all our uh, citizens? So I think uh, the less is more medicine concept is crucial 
to start thinking about all the aspects of society. And I would like to thank uh, the Journal of Internal Medicine for letting us have this uh, symposia. And I'd like to thank my co-chair Ulle uh, for, for uh, siding with me here on this. And uh, I hope I can see you soon in the future. And I'll leave it over to you. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, just final word that there will be uh, a couple of re review articles on uh, uh, the, the, these uh, important topics that uh, have been discussed on this uh, gym symposium. Of course, that, that uh, before they are published, that that will be in a, in in a, a couple of months from now. But please uh, uh, keep your attention on on the the gym uh, uh, website for these articles because uh, I think this will be great reviews and and. Um, also, thank you to Frederick, thank you to Journal of Internal Medicine, and th thanks to, to the uh, uh, Malmö Congress Bureau and the technicians for, uh, s despite that we had to have this digitally, I think it was a uh, 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 very, very uh, nice meeting. So, uh, uh, with that, I think we, we closed the meeting and um, a good day. <laughs>